used to breathless election coverage resembling a high-profile sports event, and that was certainly the case during this week's midterm elections, complete with the hype and hyperbole you'd expect from a major face-off. There's no denying it. Republicans had a good night on Tuesday. Republicans needed to flip six seats to take control of the Senate. So far, they have seven. And the media had no shortage of hyperverbal descriptors to choose from. Choose your noun, yeah. stunner, shellacking, route. We knew Republicans would have a good night. Yeah. It was a great night. But the preferred noun of the night was the proverbial wave election, dressed up for 2014. This was a wave, a Republican wave. The wave crashed so hard so fast and so fierce. The Republican wave more like a political typhoon crashing down on Democrats and President Obama. Ouch. But to really up the ante, the media cast the results as history setting. Taking historic margins in Congress. A disaster for the Democrats. Expanding their power in the House to the biggest majority since the Truman administration. OK, let's talk about history. As this New York Times graphic illustrates, it's quite ordinary for a president to finish his second term with an opposition Congress. And 2014 was no different. Yesterday As for history election, setting... The Democratic chairman, David Wilhelm, said simply, we got our butts kicked. That was Peter Jennings in 1994, a day after a true wave election. But apparently that's now ancient history. So did the media oversell the significance of this week's election results? Here to hash it out are Adam Riley of WGBH News, Joanna Weiss of the Boston Globe, Kelly Crossley of WGBH News, and Dan Kennedy of Northeastern University. Well, I can remember very clearly the 1994. I mean, I think 18 Republicans came into the House just overnight like that, wiping out incumbents. I mean, that was a, a true wave. But we have gotten so intent on specific language. It's like one media person hears it from another one, and then they lash onto that, latch onto it as if that's the only way to describe something. And then it becomes this vernacular, which is, is, frankly, is frankly hyperbolic. It just overstates it. And, you know, we went back and looked at that, that historical thing, and the majority of times when a president is in its second term, and it's the midterm elections, it's the sixth year, there's a flip over. Maybe not as dramatic as this. I don't want to say that this wasn't dramatic. This was a big change, but it's routine fairly routine. Well, it is, but on the other hand, this really was a big one. Okay. And I mean, there were certain races that the media were watching pretty closely, like Michelle Nunn in Georgia. They thought that she would at least be able to force a runoff, and she fell way out of the running. So, and there were a number of races like that that you could point to. I mean, every close race that the Democrats might have had a chance in, they lost. But I think that Yeah, what, maybe the media oversold that race. Well, maybe there was no chance she was going to win. It's very possible. <laughs> but I do think that one of the things that the media tend to look toward is a lot of these reporters came of age in 1998 when Bill Clinton kind of defied mm -hmm. the pattern mm -hmm. and and uh, the Democrats actually made gains in Congress that year. But that was a real yeah, outlier. People don't remember 94. Yeah, they don't. They can't expect <laughs> that to happen every time. I would also say a lot of the campaigning this year in all of these races across the country was about Obama. I mean, a lot of the Republicans were really campaigning less for themselves and more against Obama. We saw that in the ads that spilled over into the Boston area from the New Hampshire Senate race. All these Scott Brown attack ads that show Jean Shaheen and, you know, it looked like she was, she and Obama were locked in an embrace or they were going to start <laughs> waltzing or something. How I mean, do you it was OBAMA, yeah. exactly. So that really was part of that rejection was part of the storyline. Legitimately, I agree, and and that was a legitimate storyline. There's, there's no question about it. I'm, I'm, I'm talking more about the language too. Well, I think uh, it's all about context. So uh, both Dan and Joanna have, have mentioned pieces of the context that I think you have to take a, a piece of, but the pollsters are way off people, so that's part of it. So driving some of this was the, the pollsters saying, this is gonna be happening, this is gonna be happening, and now we get down to it, and a lot of races that people did not believe were gonna be that too close to call, in fact, were. So then it becomes, on the night of the election, oh my God, you know, what is happening here? It feels like a volcano um, in the moment, because that's not what was predicted. What was predicted is there'd be a few that would be absolutely out, and then the rest would, you know, but it wouldn't be sort of this close to call where it, it was clear that the electorate was struggling around who they wanted to support up until the last minute. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, another bit of context mm -hmm. that we got to include here is, 
just the press's propensity for being drama queens mm. when it comes to any election and, and overstating the implications of what happened. Remember when President Obama was elected the first time and the storyline was basically the demise of the Republican Party this oh, year yeah, and yeah. from here on out. You know, how can mm. the Republicans remain current in this new America that elected Barack Obama? Obviously, that turned out to be a really stupid storyline to run with. <laughs> I would have had less of a hard time with the coverage of the midterms if there had been a little critical self-reflection on, you know, if people had found a way to, to say, acknowledge their mistake dismissing the GOP six years ago. But yeah, we get carried critical. away. It's critical. more exciting to cover it if you feel like it's a historically mm -hmm. unique thing. And by the right? way, there's, no, there's yeah. never any critical self-analysis, you know, no. going back and looking at things historically, nor is there any critical self-analysis, uh, Kelly, about the polling. That's because right. you just move right past it. I mean, even here in this state, 10 days before the election, the Boston Globe had Charlie Baker nine points ahead. Now, that was before the fisherman tale yeah, and stuff he was. like that. I, I know, but then 10 points, I. I, well, I get you. Uh, you know, there, I, I was interviewing a, lo a lot of political scientists right after that poll came out, and none of them believed yeah. it. They said, it's going to come back, so where is it really? Mm -hmm. So I think there was a struggle. and. Really, one of the stories I want to know is wh why were they all struggling? They seem to be struggling across the country, no matter where the races were, to tell us um, where there would be really true, very close to call races. I think the hardest thing for pollsters to get right is turnout patterns. Hmm. I, th I think that overall they're right, but hmm. they don't know who's going to show up on that's election day, and I think that's what we saw this mm -hmm. week. Well, and they're very different in a midterm compared mm -hmm. to a presidential yes. year, and I think harder to predict in yep. a midterm year.